is said the Merigo Vespucci named the north coast of South America Venezuela, Little Venice, because of the houses on stilts he found there. Probably these hamlets haven't changed much in 400 years, but other parts of the coast certainly have. This is Caracas, a metropolis of two million people. Caracas has been destroyed by earthquakes several times and rebuilt each time. A few homes dating from the Spanish colonial days have survived the quakes. The first Europeans came to Venezuela seeking gold. They later found black gold, crude oil. They've been mining it ever since. Foreign oil companies operate the wells. They pay the state royalties on their production, about $100 million a month. Much of the money is spent on building and beautification, mainly in Caracas. Much less attention is paid to the ranchitos, the shacks which house the poor. Under successive presidents, much of the oil money has been spent on public buildings, skyscrapers, broad avenues, and highways. There are no highways or skyscrapers in the jungles of the upper Orinoco River. Few outsiders intrude on the jungle tribes. A few prospectors, traders, missionaries. None stay for long. Heat, rain and disease have hindered every attempt at settlement. Some areas become swampland in the rainy season. The Llanos, the tropical grasslands, are green and fruitful after the rains. But they support few people because most of the land is used for cattle ranching. The third large land area, Venezuela, lies to the west on the other side of the Andes. This is foothill country, sparsely inhabited by industrious but primitive farmers. The villages seem empty because so many people have moved to Caracas. 
motor transport and the new highways make it easy to do so. Few of the country people find a good life in the city. Most wind up in the ranchitos. Only the wealthy few can afford luxury apartment houses. The extremes of wealth and poverty in Caracas are great. Still, the city is a magnet for the country people. One reason is welfare. Part of the oil royalties support the welfare system, so no one need go hungry. Like most South American countries, Venezuela has a broad mixture of racial strains. The stores in Caracas have a great range of goods for sale. Some are locally made, but a great many have to be imported and are very expensive. Staple foods are inexpensive, and plenty of fruits and vegetables are grown in the area around Caracas. Jobs are hard to come by in the capital. The streets abound with peddlers, salesmen of all kind, people catching lifts. Everywhere there are the makeshift shacks, the ranchitos. They're in all the outlying areas and in every nook and cranny of the city itself. At the other extreme, wealth and luxury. A world sealed off from the ranchito dwellers. Every youngster in Venezuela can attend school and even obtain higher education. But for so many, the gulf between the ranchito and the university is simply too great. There's growing unrest in the universities. Many students are convinced that foreign investors, notably the oil companies, are taking more from Venezuela than they should. These students call for the nationalization of oil production. Also, they say that not enough Venezuelans hold top positions. Atención eso Caracas, atención eso Caracas. Other Venezuelans and foreign investors claim that outside capital was essential in developing the industry. The argument continues. So does production.
All Venezuelans hope that crude oil can support a broader, more varied industrial structure. A beginning has been made. New refineries, chemical plants, iron foundries, cement works. Large sums are being poured into a network of highways. The hope is that the future holds more jobs, better living standards, better homes. It will need to, since Venezuela's population is growing very rapidly. <laughs> Thank you.